historical society before we knocked it out. Yeah, there's a lot of that stuff here. There might even been some old vehicles and stuff. Really? Yeah. Mike? Well, Six o'clock. You ready? You're showing her own, partner. I want to tell you how to do your job. <laughs> Almighty and everlasting God who presides over all things in heaven and earth, come and preside over these deliberations so that those that make the decisions may be guided by your wisdom. Roll call, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Brooks. Here. Ms. Gilbert. Present. Mr. Merritt. Here. Mr. Barrett. Here. And Mr. Velasco. Here. Also in attendance tonight is Controller Darren Snyder, Administrator Rick Gazensky, Deputy Administrator uh, slash City Attorney Tim Henry, Director of OCD Joyce Zekowski, and uh, her intern Robert Collagen from Wilkes University, Assistant City Clerk Catherine Payne, Administrative Assistant uh, Lisa San Filippo. <coughs> Good evening and welcome to all. Tonight's meeting is a regular session of City Council. Please turn off all cell phones. According to the First Amendment, this meeting is a limited or designated public meeting, as all regular sessions of City Council are. The chairperson is the presiding officer of the meeting. As a City Council meeting, specific rules and procedures of Council are followed. The list below are examples of important rules. They are not intended to be a complete list. Persons addressing the Council shall limit their address to five minutes. All remarks should be addressed to the Council as a body and not to any individual member thereof. No persons are allowed to address the council from beyond the rail except the speaker at the dais who has the floor. The chairperson shall preserve order and decorum, prevent attacks on personalities, and the impugning of members' motives. The chairman shall determine all points of order. No person except city officers or the representatives shall be permitted within the rail in front of the council during any meeting without the express permission of the council. Finally, in order to be heard by all here in attendance, as well as be picked up by the microphones and recorders, when members of the administration are speaking, please stand up and speak into a microphone, and council will speak into their microphones at the table. Does anyone wish to speak on legislation pending before council tonight? Okay. Make a rush. Go right into the formal order of business and uh, first is a consent agenda for resolutions motion second and vote is needed motion Beth second and Mr. Brooks Tony <laughs> I was just going to say that might have been too that's Mr. Brooks yes Ms. Gilbert yes Mr. Merritt yes Mr. Barrett yes and Mr. Velasco. Yes. Motion passes. Next is uh, the single ordinance. Motion second and vote. Motion. Mr. Velasco. And second. Mike Merritt. Mr. Brooks. Yes. Ms. Gilbert. Yes. Mr. Merritt. Yes. Mr. Barrett. Yes. And Mr. Velasco. Yes. Motion passes also. Presentations. Council presentations. Mr. Brooks? Yes. Um, wait, let me sign this. Thank you. I just want to make a comment about the article uh, about uh, the gift that Mayor uh, George accepted. Um, to me, it comes down to an appearance problem. I will commend the mayor for reporting it, and so he did the legal thing to do, but none of us should take gifts of any kind whatsoever. Um, and I know Beth and I have talked about this before at other meetings about looking at legislation to either <coughs> have zero contributions. I know you posted it. I don't take money or gifts from anyone uh, who does business with this city, mm -hmm. but to codify that in legislation and in, in law, um, and we can certainly do this together, 
um, to limit the contributions that you do. Um, I know for a fact that in Miami Beach, they limit it to uh, $250 for um, you know, a construction company that's doing it. Um, I would do zero, but I think there's legal issues about First Amendment rights that they have to participate in political process, so that's why they limit it a little bit. So uh, I just want us to be aware um, about the, just the conflict of it in the appearance. Um, second, um, as you know, the, there was an article in the paper about LCTA moving to the old Murray site, and I had conversations with their public affairs and D director of finance today, and if this all works out, that's 170 jobs that comes to Wilkesbury. So obviously 170 times 52 and whatever employees live in this city, uh, 2.5 tax for us and 0.5 for the, the school board. And then I put it out there about a pilot. So Rick, I'll set up a meeting with them for us to go sit down with their finance and their director uh, if this all happens to get a payment out of that. And then three, uh, it must have been Christmas for potholes today because so many were filled. <laughs> And um, it's really nice when your constituents call you and complain about a pothole, but then they call you back and thank you. So I got three thank you texts today from, uh, for potholes being filled. So thank you, Rick, and pass that on to, uh, to Butch Friday as well. That's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Gilbert. Um, yeah, I mean, I concur with Tony regarding the campaign contribution specifically. Um, you know, this is something that council's talked about before, and I think it's something that we can all come to some sort of a compromise on. Um, so I think Tony and I will kind of spearhead that and see what we can come up with and obviously talk to all you guys too. Um, secondly, just an update on the construction on Public Square. Um, it seems like it's been going on for a long time. I don't know if anyone here knows what the status is of the project there and when it's supposed to end. I know the farmer's market is quickly approaching. Um, so if I could just get an update, if anyone knows. We'll have to talk to Butch, okay. I would imagine. Yeah, we can talk to Butch about that. Butch would know. Okay. That's all I have. Mr. Mr. Uh, Barrett? Just a comment well, after the fact, but it's, it has to do with the uh, PennDOT sweeping agreement, it's called. Mm -hmm. But I would suspect reading it that there's a little bit more involved. And I wanted to check with Butch on that. but. I wanted to make sure that we are getting reimbursement for things other than sweeping. Uh, as you know, some of these state roads are in pretty bad shape, specifically Scott Street. I complain about it all the time. And with that amount of money, $3,500 to $3,600 a year for all the state-owned roads in the city covers more than keeping them clean, uh, that's a gift. And we're certainly losing our shirt on that if we're doing 12 miles of state roads for $3,600. I don't want to stop the agreement, but I think we need to look further into it and see if, in fact, we are doing more than we need to be doing and put the burden for those major repairs back on the state where they belong. When they talk about minor maintenance, all right, that's fine. But if we're trying to keep a road open, it probably should be closed and having our people out there doing all the plowing. The plowing is one thing, the, 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 the filling of the hole and the rust that you just talked about, those types of things. I know that, I, I joke about it, they paint lines that right over the potholes all the time. They're good at that. They are very good at line painting. And again, thank you to the city workers, or well, not the city workers, but I see that we are getting lines painted out there. Just <coughs> the boulevard, and they're actually out there painting them right now. In Pena, so I think there's a little bit of an impetus to get that done, but that's great regardless of how it happens. It needed to be done, but uh, maybe Mr. Gazinski can talk to Butch about that and make sure that, because uh, there's a provision in there for excess cost incurred, just plowing streets, plowing 12 miles of roadways and salting and all those types of things. And if that's the case, maybe in the future we should look and say, here, you want it? Here it is, we'll give it back. Right. We'll take care of it. Great. And, and that's all I have. But again, thanks for the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, be it true. Mr. Merrick, I need I, I've got nothing new since Tuesday, Michael. Okay. Thank you. We'll go on to public discussion. John Sahoski. <coughs> John Sahoski, Elman Lane. Uh, okay, uh, talking about the Murray complex. Uh, uh, right behind there, there's there's basically like it's a shanty town. It's like you know there's uh, tents and it's a tent village back there. 
like selling that like is the city going to do anything to fix that situation because you can't have you know we're selling you know lcta is going to come to that building you can't have like you know you know like a shanty town just sitting behind it or is, is there going to be any kind of enforcement on that area i mean i don't think you guys have to come down like with the hammer on these people like you know come with help as well but you know i think that you can't have you know tents just sitting there a tent city kind of sitting in in the middle of the city so i you know i hope you guys address that well this building is is going to be you know a productive building again um now i have a question about uh dollar tree it is down here with the four uh it has four parking spaces with uh no meters uh my question is why are we not why don't we have the meters there because as according to the charter section 2987 uh part b time of deliveries all commercial truck deliveries shall be made to the central business district during the following hours only 7 a.m to 10 a.m and 6 p.m to 11 p.m so that seems that that we have those those four spots with no meters there for del for a loading zone and they can only get according to the charter they should be only getting deliveries between 7 and 10 and 6 and 11 and that's that's the time that the meters are off so you should be able to have working meters there um and uh, uh one last thing uh my my street was was uh the water company i, I complained about it a few times so the water company ripped up our street it finally got redone but is there any way that you guys could look into not having that contractor come back into the city? Because that's our street was a, a huge mess, and it was a mess for a good two, three months. And it was there was lo a lot of large potholes going up and down the street. And I don't think it was it, it was the you know it was, they did a poor job. You know, up the street from where they were working on on my like the next block up, they got a machine and they it fell into a hole, and it took them hours to get that machine you know heavy machinery into a hole. So. I just would look like the city to not let that company back into our city to do work here if we could, the, whoever the contractor was. And that's all I have. John, as far as that 10 city, as you call it, that's police matter. I, I would think that they'll, they'll take care of that. Um, the Dollar Tree thing, the parking, I agree with you. But I think it was through zoning, approved through, through zoning, um, that they could park there if I'm not. Uh, no, but I'm saying the ordinance says that they can't have deliveries at those times. So there's no point in ha them having that loading zone there if they're not supposed to be getting deliveries for basically most of the time that the meters are on from 7 a.m. You know, I've, I'll look at the times again. 8 to 6. Uh, yes, yeah, 7 a.m. to 10, 10 a.m. So like 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., you know, you could be collecting revenue there. And those are, those are the, you know, prime spots. They're the prime of the prime spots of the whole downtown, at least in my opinion. It's Rick, that's something we can look into? Yeah, yeah. Good. Let Go ahead. Okay. Now, John, let me start with the LCTA going into the Murray Complex. I met with them a while ago, maybe about a month or so. When construction starts there, the existing building that's there right now, that's going to be demolished. So when that construction starts, they're going to be putting up fencing <coughs> and so on. So all of the 10 city, as you would call it, to the best of my knowledge, that's all going to be eliminated. That will be taken care of when construction starts, and, and you know, I mean, that's a huge piece of property. So I know that LCT is not going to want any of that there. So they will they will take care of that. As far as the meters, I, I need to look into that to find out why. I know that's a loading and unloading zone. Is that what you're saying now? Yeah, yeah. But they, if they could only load and unload at those times, you know, we're wasting, you know, we're losing money. Yeah. So I will I will check into that for you. And who who came to your street? Was it? I don't know who the contractor was for the water company. It was the water company. Yeah, but it was, you know, it was, you know, obviously it wasn't them, it was somebody they contracted. So we need to get all the water company and we'll find out who it was and, and if it's that bad, we'll... It, it's it. fixed now, but it was bad for, for months, like there was... So it is fixed now? Yeah, they just fixed it, but it oh, was, okay. yeah, right. it was well, horrific. Good. Thanks for telling me. Um, so, I hope I answered some of your questions. Okay. I'll follow up with which too about the contractor on Almond Lane. All right. Um, yeah. I think also um, regarding the homeless population behind the Murray complex there, I think this is a good opportunity for the city and the administration to be a little more proactive when it comes to the homeless population um, rather than waiting until, you know, construction is occurring and, you know, we're basically <coughs> pushing these people out of there. I think maybe 
like I said, it's time for the administration to be a little more proactive and, you know, send officers down there to talk to them. And I, I know it's a complicated matter, and I know that it's not, you know, black and white and that these people sometimes don't always want help. But um, I think this would be a good opportunity for the city to show that they actually care about the homeless population rather than just shoving them out of the area and, and actually I, offering them resources. And I know we have been down there with the police from time to time. Um, and, you know, they're not gone long before they're back. Um, so it's a problem that, you know, repeats itself over and over again. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about that as well. Um, Volunteers of America is launching a new program <coughs> for that reason, exactly what Ms. Gilbert had just said, to work with not only um, community development, but our police department, um, Jay, the chief of um, fire, have put out sightings of every, everywhere that they are known to be. And their program right now um, is going to not only just woo them, mm -hmm. but encourage them more strongly, even based on your public comment last um, last year, Tony, um, not just to encourage them to get the counseling that they need to get back on their feet, temporary housing that moves into permanent housing. And they're going to try to teach them the life skills that they really need to learn, again, or give them the help that they need. So we're not just going to move them. They are. They're going to actually try to help them, which that's all I wanted to say. They, every, the the subrecipients are aware of it, and it has been something that's been lacking, and they're stepping up to the plate. Good. Thanks, More sure. comprehensive uh, solution. Michael, could I add to that, too? Sure. Um, yeah, not only behind a Murray complex, but we also have to be active over in Nisbet Park yeah. and by Kirby. Okay, Great. because we get big it's problems terrible there. terrible summer. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have. Have to make a suggestion, maybe you know, use LSA money for some kind of shelter or something along those lines. Good idea. Angel Drew. Angel Road Forty Seven Minor Street. Uh, it could have been a better opportunity just to be speaking on. Again, uh, a few years ago, I proposed a program, a police civilian academy. Again, this is a program that civilians will work with the police officers about seven, eight weeks. And each week they will go in, they can teach about fingerprinting, identification. Again, this serves a purpose. People more feel more involved with the police, and the police feel more involved with the community. As we see what's going on in this community, again, one of our weakest links are just what now discussing now about helping veterans. We've been addressing that program with every organization I know in this town has been dealing with that. Again, this is something that we worked with the police long ago. And with the city administrators, this could have been avoided. We could have been working this out. This situation is not getting better, ladies and gentlemen. I can give you names of other homeless places you don't even know about. Deep in the woods where veterans are now out there with the whole families, pots and pans, <coughs> everywhere. That's a come, I say, and it's much that's really needed. We need some coordination between community leaders and the police and community workers. There's a big difference between what people do in the streets but the police do what you, ladies and gentlemen, do. We have to have coordination. We can sit down with you and tell you where these shelters are. We can tell you what has worked before, what has not. We can tell you how many people have worked the police, what has not worked. But until that gets done, we keep going back to the same, same thing over and over again. We need a link between the community and the police and elected officials. It is not there. There is no trust with the police, and it's not on them. But let's not forget, we've had years where there was intense battles in these halls with the police, the police chief, the mayor, and the city. Again, we need to start showing our community that we're more hands-on. I was bound fuck when, I'm bound founder when you had two shootings. I was amazed that we didn't have the next day city council and mayors out there talking to the community to calm them down. They're frightened and they're angry. And they said the only time people go down there is when they're shootings. And they're right. And they're right. People don't show up when they're voting. And they're right. We need you down there before this happens. And how many times I've been in front of this council asking, pleading with this, unless we saw it work closer together, these things will happen. I even told you down in that shooting, in that neighborhood, in that plaza would happen. I have asked people to walk down there and meet the workers, the people who run the stores with eyes and ears. Yet it falls to dead ears. I don't know why. Maybe I'm not the man to it, maybe you don't trust me. Then don't take my word. But please, don't walk in the streets. There's nothing more back to the community when members of our community lives are being shot at and we don't see community leaders now coming out and saying, don't worry, we're here, we have your back. 
All you do is put those guys in bloom jeopardy. They're the guys people take out their anger on. And it's not fair to them. We need everything we can to help our police officers. And that only happens when the community's involved when they feel they're involved and they're trusted. They don't feel they're trusted. Many people in the community don't even feel they're part of the community. No one reaches out to them. When only when bad things happen. And I've been pleading this over and over again. I know you think it's a soapbox and everything else. I'm going to keep pleading it until it comes out of your ears. Unless you start going down there, shaking hands and beating these people, asking them what is fearful. Who are their predators? Understand, we have people in this community who are being preyed upon besides the normal things. Again, I'm documenting workers who landlords increase their rent just to abuse them, charge them for their mail, okay, for their mail. Attorneys who charge and triple the rate once they find it illegal. These are things go on, and these are the people who are still willing to work with you when crime is gone and willing to make a phone call. But you have to make that outreach. You have to reach out to protect these guys of anything else. And thank you for the great job you guys do. And like they ask you guys to be social worker, drug addicts. I mean, drug and alcohol counselors, everything is unfair. But again, that's what we're up against. I like to see down the future down in the academy. I can tell you, I live down in the academy. That's one of the hot spots down there. That plaza, if it's not for that young man who has the restaurants down there, who's had those cameras, he has helped slow down the time. It's not going to stop it. It's not going anywhere. It just slowed down. You need to reach out to him and work with him more closely. He put a lot of money into the city. At least give him that respect. Again, please, either we have a civilian police academy, one. It's a program that Stratton now does, well successful, where people ask for, for civilians or the population, they fill out a form, you run a background check, and then they get the program where they learn what the police officers do. Or a civilian police commission, we sit where other major cities have, we can sit down with with the elected officials and the police force and community leaders to work programs out before they get out of hand. If you don't think, again, I have to address it, but if you think what happened with also Collins, that people in the community didn't hear that about those wrong years ago, no. People in the community hear things way before anyone else does. Again, if you have some kind of civilian police commission or someone where they could sat down and talked about this, we prevent an embarrassment for our cities and our police force. Again, I hope you consider this. Please consider, I know many times you hear me, it doesn't even get reported by the newspapers. Newspapers write a report about who gets a brick building beside what I'm just talking about now and how important it is. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's get something that we can start working together. Thank you. Thank you. Angel, Angel, for the, the homeless veterans you mentioned, let's yes. take me take me there. There and let's uh, let's put it on the county. The county on their okay. website mentions that they have outreach to homeless veterans. So whoever runs that department at the county, the three of us, let's go down and see these You're people. Back. All right, thanks. Greg Griffin. <laughs> Hello, Council, uh, citizens. I'm Greg Griffin. Uh, we have a opioid uh, survivors committee, so it's just a quick update for you. Uh, we spoke before Hazleton Council two weeks ago, and Hazleton Council is writing a joint letter to Senator Toomey asking for a federal drug task force. And uh, we, you all had copies of this a couple of months ago that were, we were bypassed by 10 federal drug task forces. Uh, the Justice Department sent them in the rest of the country, to the rest of the country. And they're doing a great job in those communities. Uh, but we didn't get one anywhere in Pennsylvania except on the other side, this side of Erie. So that's very bad. Uh, Senator Toomey contacted the Justice Department to ask to apply for 11th task force for this area and uh, preferably it would probably be good up in Hazleton because the RDA said it's the source city for drugs entering Luzerne County so Senator Toomey uh, <coughs> and with the letter from Hazleton <coughs> Council uh, it's just going to back up the fact that Senator Toomey's trying to get us a task force, a permanent, on a permanent basis. Because this drug epidemic, uh, lest we forget, we've lost 500 people in five years in Luzerne County. And that's an awful dent in the fabric of our society. Uh, we've had four record years of opioid deaths in Luzerne County. And our press contact said, for we're heading into a fifth year 
the numbers are higher than they were this time last year at the coroner's office. So 505 years, uh, possibly five record years of drug deaths. Uh, it's decimating Luzerne County and Wilkesboro. Uh, Senator Toomey also reported to our committee that he was briefed by the drug detectives that the drug cartels are now developing a process where fentanyl is placed in vapes. So a lot of vapes are being confiscated off students in schools because they bring vapes in and the kids are, it's, you know, it's, it replaces cigarettes. But the cartels are, are looking to addict younger people and it's, once they get them addicted, they'll keep, they'll keep purchasing. So uh, it's very bad news that they're going to be trying to put it in the vapes. Uh, the recent drug raids and the one with a picture of Wilkesbury where there's the shootings and then there was the big drug raid and it was looked really good on with all the drugs and they were all stacked and it looked real you know it was a fantastic job by the police department but does anyone think about it if these suspects were not shooting guns at each other would there have been a drug raid on the suspect's house? So this drug raid, although it was great, it's the tip of the iceberg, and we shouldn't be too gleeful that we cleaned up Dodge City because it's bad. And so our, our Luzerne County Drug Task Force, of course, I met with them for an hour and 15 minutes with Deputy uh, District Attorney Dan Zola. And him and his top drug detective, asked us, our committee, to go to Senator Toomey and Senator Casey and ask for funds. And that's bad. I said, why don't you go, me and a detective go? He said, it's better if the citizen group goes to listen to you more. But the Luzerne County Drug Task Force doesn't have the resources. So we're going to continue to lose good people to this dreadful addiction. Uh, and of course, this fentanyl is, is bad. It, it's almost addictive from the first use. And so that's why we must have a federal drug task force on a permanent basis. And Mr. Chairman, I, I, I know the gentleman had talked about the shacks or the tents and you said that was a police matter. Uh, well, when is the last time you all talked to a, a drug detective that you employ and asked them what's going on? What do you need? Have you talked to any DEA agents who periodically, according to the mayor, appear and disappear in a reactive, not a proactive uh, sense? So you're the governing party body here, and you fund these, this police department. And so whether or not it's a police matter or not, you all should be having a regular meeting with the chief and the drug detectives say, hey, guys, I don't want to know where the drug houses raids are coming. We just like to know what's going on. So, you know, you got, with all due respect, you're going to have to have a tighter control of this because it's getting out of your grasp. And the numbers say it is. The death count say it, says it is. And you are members of council, all for re-election too, I might add. You got to start holding the police department, the chief, the drug agents. If they need more resources, you all need to write a letter like Hazleton did. But you better do something because we're heading into the fifth year and the sixth and the seventh. So why don't we start today demanding from Washington a federal task force? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gervin. Yes. Gre Greg, do you have that letter, the Hazelton letter? The task force bypassed the cell. Right. They said, hey, who's our county? You don't matter. We should be mad at that. And they Greg. Agents, they have all the bells and whistles. They bring, they actually bring a couple district attorney aides to help with the dead, the pro, uh, the charges for delivery of uh, drugs uh, that result in death, to help our overwork DA's office. They they bring the top detectives. They help the local police department. Of course, they didn't sit, think it was important to come here. Although, of the ten areas where these task force were sent. Senator Toomey's aide, Mike Mazza, Frank. told me, Frank Mazza, told me, well, Greg, did you know of the 10 task forces sent to the 10 counties across the country? 
Luzerne County, in three quarters of those 10, we had a higher death rate. So we don't get any respect. And it's our own fault. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think what Mr. Brooks yeah. is alluding to is that um, I can't see anyone on council opposing writing a letter to the federal Don't. government, you know, asking for help. Yeah, Operation um, SOS, it's uh, Operation uh, Synthetic uh, Opioid Surge. And uh, Attorney General Sessions bragged about dispatching the 10 task forces. And that was great. They did a great job. But we actually need about 30 or 40 or 50 in America. But we would definitely need number 11 here. Um, yes. Also, have you met with Chief Coffee? Briefly, uh, we were up to mayor's office, and he was there, and uh, I asked them about additional DEA agents, and they said they had it under control. Uh, a DEA agent, uh, Drug Enforcement Administration agent, appears when they need them. Look, that's reactive. There's, there's big problems. You have to be proactive in this community to go after the predator drug dealers. The officers need the tools they need. They're, we had an officer told me a couple weeks ago that, oh, well, there's drug houses all over Wilkesboro. Excuse me? What if a roofer told me, oh, you're, all the roofs I work on leak after I leave? Look, the police officers are supposed to be given the tools to do their jobs. And if they need help from the feds, fine. But they can't, they can't not do their jobs. The, 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 the citizens are irate. So got a big problem here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anything else?